Hey, this, uh, this sermon series might be um, one of the things that me and CJ always say when uh, by about the second week um, of a sermon series, we're all ready to tear it down. And uh, we're always like that because we have looked at it continually for a week, really, really hard, spent many, many hours putting it up. And by about the first or second, usually for sure by the third week, we're saying, let's tear it down. And, but I want to tell you that throughout this sermon series of um, what we've preached, and last week I was listening to Josh getting all emotional, and, and uh, you know, he always gets emotional when he talks about kids you know, in a different country, and, and it, just, it just messes him up emotionally sometimes. And I love that about that, but, you know, as I've looked at this sermon series, um, and I think back about the sermons that we preached, the things that's happened, the way that you all have responded and picked the boxes up, um, just standing out in the front today and watching the boxes come in, and, and one thought ran through my mind today, is this is what the church is built for. Man, this is what we're built for, man. When you look from the very beginning to the very end of this sermon series, if you take everything into consideration about it, it took every single person, and I was sitting over here because I can't help myself, but I was counting like 60-something boxes and maybe more have already come in out there. And I know, I don't know how many we gave out, but I know that there's more that needs to come in. And like Josh said, we really encourage you to do that. But, you know, when I think about what it took to do that, this thought that this is what, where we are made for service. We are made to bless other people. We are made to get the gospel out of these four walls that we call church. We are made for this, people. And, and so this week I was wanting to um, just end the sermon series. And, and I told you when I preached the first week that it probably should have been the last week. Maybe this should have been the first sermon. I don't know. And I just do whatever I feel like God's telling me to do. Um, but I wanted to, as I close this, this sermon series out today, I want to leave you with basically a thought. And, and a method that OCC is about. And I want to leave you um, so that you'll never really forget as the year goes on and we come, we don't even know what we'll do next year, um, how we'll do it. We've done it several, several different ways. Um, we've even took services where we took all the chairs up and we put down tables. And, and I remember one time we did 500 boxes and, and the whole church packed on that day. And uh, that was a pretty cool And Our attendance always seemed to go down because people would be like, I don't really want to come pack boxes and I don't really understand it so we've done it several different ways but we are made for service that's what we're made for and so this week as I was trying to close it out I was thinking what could be the lasting you know a lasting statement in their head what could be that thing that I could leave them with and so this week I looked up the mission statement of Samaritan, Samaritan's Purse and OCC and what it stands for. And I want to read it to you real quick, and I think we got it on the screens. It says, Samaritan's Purse is a non-denominational evangel evangelical uh, Christian organization, listen to this, providing spiritual and physical aid to hurting people around the world. The organization serves the church worldwide to promote the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm reading that, right? I'm just looking at this statement. I'm saying, that is pretty powerful if you're really doing that. Like, it is pretty powerful to be really that bold to say, no, no, no. We are giving spiritual aid and physical aid to hurting people around the entire world. And folks, I'm going to tell you, there's not too many organizations that that could be their mission statement. I don't know how many, too many, I don't know how many mission statements or how many places could say that's going to be our mission statement and you can hold us accountable to that. So I was looking that up and I was thinking, if that's going to be your mission statement, that's pretty bold to put that out there because if you don't do it, then you're going to be a mockery and people are going to call you out on it. So uh, when I was looking up that mission statement, how powerful I thought that was, um, there, the, right underneath of their mission statement was a couple different websites that said uh, reasons why you should not support OCC. And uh, you can go and you can look at that yourself, but I just want to run, this is so funny, so I can't help myself. I like to see what the other party thinks, and I like to see what the other side thinks about things. Um, so I was like, oh, I'm going to see what they say, and I clicked on it. And, uh, and, it, and it, listen to this, and it said, the first thing that you need to understand when you're supporting OCC is that you're supporting Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, and you are supporting him and his ministry and his church. And I'm thinking, I don't have a problem with that. Not really. Not really. 
You know what I mean? Billy Graham has led millions of people to the Lord, and his kids are too. I guarantee it. And so the second thing is, it says, you're supporting the narrow-minded view of Christianity. And I'm like, I don't have a problem with that, right? I'm thinking, okay, you need to make your stance a little better. i got to be a little stronger than that. And it said, you know, the third stance on it is when Franklin Gang uh, Graham, he attacked Target and other, and other uh, stores about their position on whether they should be allowed to have basically men and women's restrooms and being united and it says we don't think that's right and I'm thinking I'm still with Franklin Graham on this one folks I don't know about you but I'm still but I'm thinking this is terrible you know and so and I looked at it and it says another one of our points that we have a real issue with is they put Jesus tracks in every single box and even if your church doesn't do it they do it and, and they send these tracks to all these kids in these countries and then as soon as these kids open up these gifts they start telling them about Jesus and how Jesus can save them from going to hell and I'm thinking, amen, that's right. He does, they do that. And I, we agree with that. And I'm thinking, what is your point here? Like, what's your stance? Like, seven reasons why you shouldn't support it. And all seven, I'm reading them. And I'm looking, man, this is so liberal. That's ridiculous. That it's so liberal that you don't even really want to share the gospel. And I started thinking about that. And I started thinking, that's where we've come. That's where we've come, is that when somebody does something, listen, whenever you're doing something and your mission statement says that you're going to spiritually do this and, and get aid and physical and spiritual aid, anytime you see that, I want to tell you, criticism is on its way. Anytime, even our church, when you look at our church and, and you look at what we do, criticism is on its way. Why? It's because you can't please everybody, right? It would be impossible to please every single person. And so you know that in this world, if you're going to say we're going to go to the world, then you might as well expect the world is going to criticize what you're doing. And so don't ever, don't ever get too reared up whenever somebody gives you criticism about what you do or about what you don't do. Just make sure you're doing the right thing and what the Lord called you to do, and you're going to be okay. But I, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to share, basically, if you were to look at OCC, if you were really to look at the church, if you were to look at us, what is the main theme of what we do? What's the main theme? And, and if you look at this, I wanna, I wanna share just a couple points with you that I believe that God has really put on my heart and says, Earl, you need to start focusing on this stuff. Earl, they focus on it. Earl, this is what the church focuses on. So if the church is focusing on it, the people should be focusing on it, the pastor should be focusing on it, and the leadership should be focused in this direction. And the first thing is, is the box that they send, it really isn't the real gift. It's not the real gift, folks. The real gift is, yes, you're going to bless some children with some toys. Yes, you're going to bless them with a, you know, a toothpaste or a toothbrush. Yes, you're going to bless them with something to write with or something to color with. And, and there might be a hair bow here and a hair bow there or, or a Hot Wheel. And there might be a stuffed animal like you see up here. Or, or, you know, here's our Hot Wheel. And we give them markers sometimes. And we give them things to play with. And, but the true message behind what they do and what the church believes is that we believe that Jesus is the real gift. It's not in how it comes. You know, the box is just a box. If you look at this box and, and how much time that you spent, the real message behind this box, when it reaches this girl who's going to be between the age of five and nine, and I have no idea, one of you in here today, now I have no idea who built this box, but one of you in here took time to pick it up, to go put stuff in it. And, but you need to understand that the message behind Operation Christmas Child is that this is not the real gift. It's not the real gift. See, the real gift is what they do with that box. The real gift is that they're sharing Jesus and they're doing that. And they're saying, you know, here's the gift, but this is what it's really about. It's about Jesus. And I was thinking, you know how easy it would be to forget that, that it's about a box? You know how easy it would be to forget it's about Jesus and just focus on a box? 
You know how easy it would be to, you know, say, well, we got to do this many boxes and this many boxes. And I remember, listen, I'm going to just, I'm going to fess up right now to y'all. Um, as a pastor, we started out with doing like 25 boxes at 2020 when I was there, uh, pastor in there. Then we went to 100 boxes and we got real bold and, and everybody wanted to say, let's do 200 boxes. And the next year we said, we're going to do 500 boxes. And, and like I said, we took up all the chairs. We put out all the tables. We did all the work. And, and I remember all the soap and all the rags and all the pencils and everything that went in them. I really do. But I also remember while I was walking around the room just saying, are we done yet? We're just like it's in an assembly. Boom, boom. Put this in, put this in, put this in, put this in, put this in. Okay, that's good. Okay, this box is good. Let's go to the next box and let's go to the next box and let's go to the next box. And it's real easy at any point in time from the time that it starts and gets folded to the time that it reaches the child, it's, it's, it's easy for each person that touches that box because they've got a job to do, whether it be loading a trailer, whether it be loading a box, whether it be driving it, whatever it is that they're doing, it would be easy to say, it's just about getting the box there. It's just about getting the box to the child. That's all it's about. And really, it's not. That's not what it's about. It's about getting the message of Jesus Christ and what he did to that child. That's the real thing. And listen, Romans 5, 8 says it the best. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to think about something. I, when, when I first thought about coming to really being religious. When I thought about it, you know what, I, I, I need to really get my act together and I need to start going to church. When that thought crossed my mind, I want to let you know that I really felt in my heart that I need to get myself in order for, for God to accept me, for God to love me. I needed to get my affairs in order. I needed to get rid of some music, and I needed to get rid of some things that I was doing in my life, and, and, and I needed to get rid of some of the things that I watched on TV, and I needed to talk different. I needed to walk different. I needed to, you know, everything that come out of my mouth needed to be different, and, and yes, I believe that those things will happen when God God truly changes your heart. I believe that there's a process that when you get saved, things happen over a long period of time to really bring you to a place where, where you can really look and say, man, I've changed. But the truth is, is that if you want to be honest about it, listen, Christ died for you. And he hung on the cross while you were still in your mess. While you were still out there doing things you shouldn't have been doing. While you were still running around on your spouse, maybe. Or while you were still looking at porno on, on, on the web. While you were still drinking the alcohol and getting drunk every other weekend like I used to. I used to drop my kids off at, at my mother and father-in-law's house. And we'd be like, see you later. See you Sunday. He knows we did. <laughs> drop them off on Friday. Pick them up on Monday. It was a great benefit. They loved the kids. We knew they loved the kids. We knew that they were safe. Even though, you know, my son and my daughter would do some of the stupidest stuff when they would be there and they would tell me about it. But I didn't care. Why? Because I knew I had a weekend babysitter to do whatever me and my wife wanted to do. And a lot of times that involved doing stuff that we should not have been doing. But the truth is, is even while I was doing that, Christ loved me. And Christ loved you enough to die for you while you were still in that mess before you jumped through all your religious little hoops, before you did everything that you did to become who you are today. I want to let you know that Christ had already completed everything that he was going to do before you ever said, I do. He completed everything that he was ever going to do before you ever got committed to coming to church. He, he done every single thing that he was ever going to do before you ever committed your family and teaching your children and dedicating your children to the Lord like we did last week. That's a great thing. But the truth is, is that the truth be known is that Christ died for us while we were still back here in our mess. And that is the real truth and the real gift of the gospel is that he loved us even when we were in that shape. Think about this, when you, when you start sharing the gospel to kids who have never read that verse, who have never heard about Jesus, who have never been offered children's church, 
who, and some of these kids are looking at this and somebody's standing there sharing the gospel and they're offering classes to these kids to understand who Jesus is. That is the real gift of what OCC does. And it's easy to get distracted, right? Second thing is, I want to tell you, there's no way you can do OCC. It would be impossible to do OCC. It would be impossible to really lead a church well if you don't have compassion. You got to have compassion, folks. If you don't have compassion for people, you're in the wrong business. I'm going to call myself out on that. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of time my compassion meter is running on real low. I'm going to tell you, I've seen so much in church lately I'm, and in the 15 years of my life that sometimes I look at stuff that happens in church and I said, that's just plain stupid. Right? The way, way they, they're, acting, they're acting like they have lost their minds. We've all done that, right? Yes, we have. Our, <laughs> yes, we have, Joe. But our meter for compassion... If you're not compassionate for people, if you're not compassionate about the lost, if you're not compassionate, you may be in the wrong business. Why? It's because, listen, I want to give you a verse right here to show you that, that compassion was Jesus' driving force. This was his driving force. It's a driving force for OCC. I believe it's a driving force for our church. We have to have compassion. Matthew 9, 35 and 38, listen to this. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, listen to this, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. This is God's harvest. It's God's world. And what Jesus was saying is, listen, <laughs> you got to have compassion. you got to love people. And there's only one way that you can truly take a box and fill a box and do all the logistics behind what happens at OCC and get it to a child. The only way you could really do that is if you really truly had compassion for everyone, not just white people, not just black people. Right? Oh, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to hit on a subject right now. I, I got a news flash for y'all. And I know y'all ain't going to... I don't know how many of y'all even heard this. But I got a news flash. Jesus, he was an American. <laughs> and he wasn't white. <laughs> He's not this long, lock, white guy, about 35 years old that we see in all the pictures. That's not him. Jesus was not American. He couldn't have went and fit out a job application and put, what are you? Well, I'm just Caucasian. That's not, that's, he couldn't have done that. He couldn't have done that. So why do we see so much racism in our world today by people that call themselves Christians? Folks, if you don't love a little black child, I'm going to call you out on it right now. If you don't love a little Mexican child, I'm going to call you out on it right now. If you don't love the little Japanese kid, I'm going to call you out on it right now. Every culture across the world... I want to share something with you. When Jesus meant, and he said, telling the church to go to all the world sharing the gospel, he wasn't just talking about white people. He wasn't just talking about your race and your ethnic. And it's time that the church stands up and realizes that racism needs to be stomped out of the churches. Call it for what it is, stomp it out. And I know you say, well, you know what? We see that on both sides. I read a book one time, and, and I, 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 this is kind of off task a little bit, but I don't care. <laughs> when I was in college, I read this book of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, called Becoming King. 
If you want to really know the true story of Martin Luther King Jr., it's not about the month of February, about Black History Month. I challenge you. Go to your local library, find the book, get online, order a book called Becoming a King by Martin Luther, G uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And you will find out that that guy is pretty amazing at what he did. Pretty amazing that he didn't even want to be the spokesperson for uh, the African American people. He didn't want that. Why? Because he was too busy being a preacher preaching the gospel. What? That's what he was. He was a preacher. And they come to him and they said, man, you speak too well. You can lead the people too well. You need to represent him. He said, I don't want that. He said, because y'all don't want to hear what I, I, what I want to say. And when they come one night and he was sleeping in his bed and they threw rocks through his front, uh, through his front windows, you know what he did? And, 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 and all the, the black community come to his door and they're all carrying shovels and they're all carrying picks and they're all carrying things of weapons. You know what he did? He, he went out on his front porch and he said, go home. And they said, why? Aren't you ready to fight now? And he said, fighting will never win this battle. Love will. You love them. You love them. <laughs> Folks, I'm going to tell you, the only thing that beats racism, the only thing that can even beat it's love. And so many times, man, I hear these things, stupid comments. I'm going to call it stupid. Well, why can't we help people in our community? Why can't we just take care of our own? Why? Because they're living on welfare. That's why. They don't have welfare. Amen. They get food stamps. They get all the, uh, all the housing that they want for free. Amen. Well, I don't understand why we can't help out our own. Yes, I do. Because these boxes go to kids that don't have anything. That starve and they die. But we got to start loving God's harvest. Not the American harvest, folks. And that's what Earl believes. Now, you don't have to believe that. I don't, it don't matter to me none. But we got to start having compassion, man. We don't have no compassion anymore. Like compassion for every single ethnic culture group. Uh, uh, just compassion for our neighbor. Compassion for the people sitting right next to us in church. We need compassion. And that's what I love about Pastor Josh. When every time he gets up here and he talks about, you know, going to, you know, you know to, to the mission field and how it changes life. I love when he, when he gets emotional, we all should be crying. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Why? Because every time he talks about holding a little kid, and every time he talks about it, man, he just, I mean, there's something God does in him about what happened to him on the mission field that says, this changed my life forever. And this kid was just like holding Jesus. It's called compassion. But I got to move on. I could just stay right there, really, to be honest with you. I could just stay right there for an entire sermon on how the church needs to really love people. It'd be real easy, but I got to move on. Third thing I want to tell you, we need to stick with the task at hand. Do you understand that when these boxes leave here and you did these boxes and they leave here and this whole process that I shared with you two weeks ago, um, you know, about them going and they hit the trailers and then they go to the planes and, and Linda was even telling me this week that, that, you know, she said, do you know that, that, that the boxes actually that at some points they don't have trucks and they don't have trailers? Do you know they put them on donkeys to get them where they are, put them on camels to get them where they need to go? And I said, these boxes sometimes end up on a camel? And she's like, yeah, like they put them on a camel to get them to the small village because there's no other way to get them there. And I said, that is amazing. But I want to tell you, do you know how easy it would be with all of the logistics? And if you don't know what the word logistic means, everybody uses the word logistics. All it means is basically transportation of something. That's all it means. Like, what do you do? I'm logistics. I work in logistics. Oh, so you work in transportation. Yeah, oh, okay. You know, I'm, I'm a logistics coordinator. Okay, well, logistics is nothing more than just transportation. But you know how easy it would be to get off target, to, to not stick to the task at hand, to get so frustrated and say, well, we got to do this and we got to do this and, and forget about the gift, forget about the compassion, and all you really worry about is the job that you're doing. And this week when I was writing this, God was saying, Earl, I want you to understand the church sometimes does that. 
Earl, you sometimes do that. Earl, the church members sometimes do that. Why? He said, because sometimes, Earl, you get so caught up into what you're doing. He says, there's times you get caught up in just getting a good message down on paper that you forget really what it's all about. And I'm like, come on. He's like, no, that's the truth. And the truth is, is we got to stick to the task at hand. What is the task at hand? Go back to point one. The box isn't the real gift. The church isn't the real. These four walls, that's not the real gift, folks. A talented sermon or a talented worship team, that's not the real gift. The real gift is that we are all coming together because of this thing called Jesus Christ that died on the cross for us. So when you understand that and you have the compassion and you stick to the task at hand, I want to tell you, it's, a, it's hard to fight distractions in church. It's hard to fight distractions in our life sometimes. But God gave me just a few of them, I believe. And he says, one way to fight distraction is stay close to God. That's the easiest way. Listen to this. There's even a verse for it. James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you devil-minded. And what he's saying is here. You Listen to this. I just want you to catch the first line. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And I, and I was thinking about that, and I, I'm going to do a little example. Come here, Roger, for a second. I just want to show you what this looks like. I got to tell you something before. Huh? All right, so this is, yeah, there's God. I'm calling him right now. He's saying, listen. So this is what it looks like right here. This is, this is what it looks like. You're over here. You got to go a little farther, bro, because sometimes I get pretty far away from God. I ain't going to lie. I'm almost going to tell you. So here, here's what I believe, what that Bible's saying, and what this verse is saying. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. See, when you find yourself distracted, all you got to do is go like this. That's it. And then you get, you're just saying, I got to focus on God. And, and you're saying, I, 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 I got to find God. Man, I've got to get my eyes focused on God. I got to get, see, see here's, the, here's, the, here's the point. What Jesus is really saying in this verse, and what God really wants you to understand, is that if you will head that way, God will meet you halfway. He'll meet you halfway. And so many times people are saying, I can't find God. I can't find God. Where's God at? No, 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 no. The Bible says this. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. So every step you make toward God, every step you make, guess what? God's coming toward you. It's a one line. There ain't a big circle. There ain't a big closet. You're just going around in the dark saying, God, where you at? God, where you at? No, it ain't like that. God says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Amen? Amen. All right, you can go sit down, brother. Oh. Second thing, listen to this. The things of this world pulls us away from God. The things of this world pulls us away from God. Mark 4, 19 says this, But the cares of the world... And the deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things enter in and choke the word and proves it unfruitful. So how can you stick to the task at hand? If the task is really saving souls for the church, if the task is really getting these boxes to the children, if we don't focus on the task, if we don't really focus on our mission, what is the mission? The mission is to get to the lost, to, to disciple the church, and, and, and to bring people up. If we don't really focus on that, here's what, the, here's what the Bible says. But the cares of this world and the deceitfulness and the desires for other things, what other things are we talking about? Oh, we all know what they are. I guarantee you can think of something in your life right now that draws you away from God. I bet you could think of something that takes up your time. I almost did this, but I didn't really didn't have figure out how I could do it and make a good illustration of it. But I thought about how cool would it be is if you could hand out, um, just hand out, you know, like, like everybody, like 24 nails, right? Like, I'm going to give you 24 nails. I want you to imagine this in your head, that I walked up and I just handed you 24 nails and I gave you a hammer and I gave you a board and I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit down on the floor right where you're at and I want you to take 24 nails. Now, these 24 nails, what they do is they represent, they represent 24 hours in a day. 
And then what I want you to do is I want you to realize that, that most people should be sleeping. Now, I don't sleep seven or eight hours a day because I, I, for some reason, if I get like four hours, that's enough because um, I can hardly even sleep. But, you know, it, it just, I just want you to say, okay, let's just take seven of those nails and we got to nail them into the board. Those are gone because that's really when you should be sleeping. So, okay, you're going to take the remainder of the hours you have. Okay, so let, let's, let's do the, how many nails do you need? Listen to this. How many nails do you need? for what your children's activities are. Put some nails in the board. How many nails do you need for the hours that you spend a day at work? Put them on there. How many hours do you need for the time that you, uh, you know, traveling back and forth and things that you do? This, put them in there. And then when you get to the end, I want you to realize is that, you know, it, the cares of this world and our crazy, hectic schedules that we have allows very little time for what really matters most. If I were to give you 24 nails and I would say this, I want you to categorize your life and you've got 24 nails to do it. Would you start out at the very beginning of that, you know, knocking the nails in, would you say that, the, well, since God is the priority of my life, I need to really figure out how much time do I spend with God first and then hammer them in first before I even go to sleep, before I even go to activities, before I even go to the work thing. I need to figure out in the very beginning is how much time am I giving the thing that should have the most priority, the most things in my life, I mean, my most focus. Would, it, would you even start there? And see, God says this. God says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. I can solve the whole problem if you just draw near to me. Second thing is he says, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches and the desires of other things, they enter in. And they choke out what God wants to do in your life. You know how easy it would be to do that? I got an example, and I don't know if I've ever shared this example, and if I have, then you get to hear it twice, and praise God, you'll get it twice, and you'll know it twice. But this lady, one day after church, she come up to the pastor after he got done preaching his little heart out. And I've had that happen to me a couple of times. And somebody comes up to the pastor, and they, say, and they say, Pastor, I want to let you know something. Is that I'm no longer going to be attending this church. I'm leaving the church. And he's like, Why? Because he had just preached his guts out, he felt, you know. And, and she's like, well, I want to tell you why I'm believing. It's because, see, the, you know, Beth over here, see, Beth, she doesn't even listen to your sermons. And I'm sick and tired of watching Beth not watch your sermon. It just drives me insane. And it's, you know what else bothers me too, Pastor? It bothers me how you do this or how you do that or, or, or how Roger's over here. See, Roger, well, you know, he just sits there and he just looks like he ain't even paying attention. He's got his arm crossed. And for me, I believe that that means he's not paying attention. And see, there's, there's like four or five youth in the back and all they, they ain't even looking up when I'm even talking. And they're on Facebook right now, just on Instagram. And that just drives me nuts, Pastor. And he's listening and he just lets her go. And she gives him like 10 or 15 reasons why the church and the church people is just nothing but hypocrites. And how she's so frustrated with it. And he says, well, I'm going to tell you what, here's what I'm going to do. And he hands her a glass of water. He said, I want you to hold this glass real quick. Just hold this glass. And he fills it up with water almost to the brim. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. Is if you can walk around this entire sanctuary and not spill a drop... I'm going to let you leave and I'm not going to say another word to you. She said, deal. Starts walking around. And man, she's walking and he filled that mug all the way up to the brim to where it'd be almost impossible. And she's just walking and she's focused and she's going, man, like little steps at a time all the way around the sanctuary. And she, she gets all the way up the front and she says, I did it. And he says, yeah, but before you leave, I need to ask you something. While you were carrying the water, did you notice that Roger had his arms crossed? I didn't notice that. Now, when you were carrying the water, did you notice that there was youth on their phones? I, I didn't notice that. Now, when you were carrying the water, did you notice all these other things that you just pointed out to me? She says, no, because I was focused on the water. He said, and there's your problem. So you're coming to church and you're focused on people. Amen. And you're not focused on God. Because if God is really the water, 
That when you walk through these doors and you park outside and you come into this church and you walk in and, and, and you're here because you're so focused on God and what God's going to do through you today and you're going to be a blessing and you're going to share to get the message out and you're going to receive everything that the, the ministry of the band and the ministry of the preaching and you're going to get up and you're going to take that word and you're going to be focused on it. He said, you ain't got time to focus on anything else if you're focused on the right thing. Amen. Change the lady's life forever. She said, I never really thought about that, Pastor. That I've been focused on everything else except for God. She said, but I've seen that stuff happen for so long and it just had become a distraction to me. He said, listen, you got to stick with the task that is at hand. Last thing I want to share with you before the band comes up is that there are times in your life, and Jesus even gives us moments of this, that you have to get away for a moment. Now, I want to share something about that. That doesn't mean quit church. That doesn't mean see you in seven weeks and you had to get away and go out and sit in a hunting stand somewhere. That's not what I'm talking about. In Mark 6.31, he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And see, what I want to tell you is that for, for people in churches, there are times where people are digging at you and they're coming at you so much and that there may be times where you need to be alone with God or, or maybe even alone with the people that pray. And just get back for a minute, separated from everything. And it, like a lot of people think it's goofy. Like that I'll go back to the office when I first get here and I'm looking over my message and then there's times where if I'm preaching, like sometimes I even sit back here and I'm just praying that God would move through this message and, and, and I really want to see God do something. See, I'm not, I'm not you know, in, in a desolate place because I want to be by myself even though that I'm not the greatest people person if I was to be completely honest. I don't mind really being alone for a moment. You know, it doesn't bug me. Doesn't bug me. But I want to tell you that there are times where if you're not in the right frame of mind with God, if you're not, if you're so busy that you don't even have time for God, and you're just so strung out and you're tired and you're wore out, you may have to draw back. You may have to draw back. Just for a moment, just draw back and seek God and seek His face. Jesus gives us multiple times in the Scriptures where He done that. You see, Jesus is the real gift. We need to have compassion. We need to fight distractions. This week I had two people speak into my life. One of them was from God and one of them was from the devil. I'm going to tell you the truth. See, this week, Randy, I, I said, Randy, we're going to lunch. He said, no, nah, I can't go to lunch today. And I said, okay, I'm going to go by myself because I like to go eat at the Mexican restaurant, um, you know, in, in Florence for lunch. And, and I go in there and I sit by myself. And, and the, I know that they're Christian owners. They play Christian music. The owner has even come out in times and prayed with me, which is really, really cool when the cook, the guy back there cooking comes out and prays for you. And, and so this week I was up there by myself and I'm sitting there and I'm going to tell you if I ever had a moment where I felt like that God come up and sat down for a moment, it happened in that moment. Crazy it happened, but it happened. See, the, see, the lady that owns the restaurant and her husband that owns the restaurant, they have an uncle that's a pastor. And, and, and at 2 o'clock, he, he, he's, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, he's Hispanic. And at 2 o'clock, Heritage Fellowship up in Florence allows him to do a Hispanic service, which is really cool. So he pastors that service, and then he also does ministry in the jails, and I had never even met the guy. So he comes up, and he sits down uh, beside, you know, sits down, and I think the lady must have said, hey, that guy's a pastor too, and down in Williamstown. And, and so he comes up, and he sits down, and he says, hey, I just want to talk to you for a second, if that's okay. And I said, yeah, man, cool. You know, and as a pastor, it's so funny that even if you're a little tired, even if you're a little wore out, man, you never want to show that because it, doesn't, it just doesn't go well when you do that because people think you're ready to quit ministry and everything else just because you get a little tired and they're freaking out. Ah! You know, what's he going to do? And, and sometimes you just get a little tired. Well, on this day, I was just a little tired. And I'm sitting there and he comes up and he sits down and he says, I got to talk to you for a second. You care if I sit down? And I said, well, go ahead. And he's like, I hear you're a pastor. I said, yeah. And he reaches over, man, and poof, grabs my hands. And he says, let me tell you something. As a man of God, 
who has done it for many years, and I know you've done it for many years. You are in an honored position in every single thing that you've ever done. God has called you to. And every single thing that you're going through right now, I guarantee you, it's just the devil attacking you. And this, and he's just going, I mean, on and on. And I'm like, I don't even know you, but it's great. It was like God himself just come up and read my mail, man. It's crazy. And then the devil showed up. Not then, at a different, a day later. And I was telling that person, you know, hey man, I'm just a little tired, man. And they said, you just need to quit doing what you're doing, dude. You just need to pull back from some of the ministry that you're doing. And right away, I felt like God was saying, I came and seen you this week, but so did the devil. Sitting right in my truck. And I looked right at this person and I said, let me tell you something right now. The minute that I quit doing everything that I'm doing, the minute that I step back, the minute that I quit doing ministry, then I'm not going to be doing anything for God. And I almost wanted to say, and I'd be just like you. But I didn't do that. Because I wanted to show compassion. You see, there's, the messages can come in a lot of different ways. It ain't always God. See, every time God wants to come tell you something, sometimes the devil wants to come tell you something. Now, does that mean that the devil's running that person's life? No, that's not what it means. But the devil is going to make sure to cause enough distraction to get you off board, to get you doing, off doing what God has called you to do. And you just have to recognize Who's speaking? See, there was a time Jesus was sitting with his 12 disciples, people that loved, loved him, followed him. And he looked and he told one of them, he said, get behind me, Satan, because what was coming out of their mouth wasn't of God. See, that can happen. Where's our priorities this week? Do we know that Jesus is the real gift? Do we know we got to have compassion for people? And how good are we at fighting the distractions that goes on on a normal basis in our life. Because I think that any time that you're going to live a healthy Christian life, you have to answer them three questions. You have to realize that Jesus is the gift. He's what really matters. You have to realize that it's going to take some compassion to do what you do. And you're going to have to realize that all along the way, through the years of service, you're going to have a whole lot of distractions coming your way. And you've got to really fight through them and prioritize what's really important. And I want to end with that, and I want to share with you this. I want to thank you as a church. Because see, what it takes to do the OCC, I've done for years. And I, and, and I know that, that it makes a difference. I know that, you know, that, that it's, it, it's easy, you know, when Josh stands up here or I stand up here and you just hear another message and you're going to walk out these doors. But what you don't understand that this week, that when you brought the boxes in, what you don't understand is that that work right here is just getting started. See, you sowed the, every one of these up here, they're not really boxes, they're really seeds. And see, you planted them by bringing them back in today. And each one of these boxes, even though you get to leave here today and you get to go watch the Bengals play the Indianapolis Colts and hopefully win by six points because that's what they're favored by. Please, for the love of God, let them win today. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like the Bengals. I ain't gonna lie. But while I'm watching the Bengals... At 1 o'clock, don't call me for one, because I might be late. But for two, these right here, these are planted in the ground. These are planted in the ground, y'all. And these boxes right here are going to go, even though you're done with them and your job's done. These boxes right here are seeds, and they're planted in the ground, and they have the potential to make faithful servants for Jesus Christ. Even though you're done with them, God says, I'm not done. So have faith, because I'm not done. I got a lot of work to do still in these boxes. A lot of lives to touch in those boxes. So if you haven't brought your box in, I want you to realize it's important. We need your box. Get it back in. If you can't fill it, you don't have the money to fill it, bring the box back. Why? 
Because I don't want that seed to be thrown in the garbage. Some of you might say, well, they didn't see me pick up the four boxes. We got you on camera. <laughs> if you picked up a box right here, you're on camera. Bring them back. But we do thank you. We thank you for what you did. Because it makes a difference. And we make a difference. Our church makes a difference. And it takes us all. I was kidding around last week and I had a number 55 on my, on my uh, shirt. And people were like, what's 55 stand for? And I said, it takes us all. And they like, what? And somebody come up and even ripped it off. Like they had the gall ripping it off my shirt. And stuck it in another place. I said, don't rip it off and put it back. And Tina, Tina come up and she says, what's that mean? I said, it means it takes us all. Haven't you heard about that big movement? I'm just kidding around. And she was like, no. I said, look it up when you get home. <laughs> so when I got home, I put 55 on Facebook. I just put 55 and hit post. And people were liking it. I'm like, they don't even know what it even means. <laughs> but the truth is, is that God has really been on my heart about telling every one of you something. Is that it takes us all to make us great. It takes us all. To make us great. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you right now, God. And God, while I realize God had done.